so thank you very much uh, for inviting me to present this paper. This is joint work with Martin Schneider. The, sorry. The, so this is about central bank digital currency, uh, which is a vague concept in a rapidly growing literature with many proposals of what central bank digital currency actually should be. And so what it's going to be in this talk, I'm going to define it as interest-bearing reserve accounts for everyone. Uh, CBDC is being proposed uh, in a market uh, for liquidity that already exists, where we see bank deposits. Uh, these are bonds with an option to sell on demand. And credit lines, uh, which, are, which give an option uh, to get a loan on demand. Uh, and these products are currently being provided by commercial banks, and they're both important. Uh, let me show you a picture of how large they are as a fraction of GDP. So here you see deposits and credit card limits uh, offered by US commercial banks, and they are both large as a fraction of GDP. So, so both forms of liquidity provision are important. We view banks as adding value by providing liquidity and they exploit the complementarity between bank deposits and credit lines. Um, we're gonna conclude that CBDC is not complementary to credit lines and therefore it's only beneficial if it's much cheaper to produce than deposits. So it's unclear whether CBDC is that beneficial. We're gonna derive these conclusions from a framework uh, that has preferences in technology as in the neoclassical growth model uh, so there are households who work uh, and consume goods. Financial markets are complete, and that gives us a representative household. There are competitive farms, and they make capital from goods, uh, and also goods from capital and labor. And we put into this uh, frictionless world liquidity constraints. There's going to be buyers of goods. These are households and capital producers who need payment instruments before they buy. They have face unpredictable liquidity needs in the sense that only a share V of them gets the chance to buy. Uh, and this V in the paper is different across households and capital producers. Here in the talk, I'm gonna simplify and make this use the same share V. And then there are sellers of goods. These are the producers of consumption goods. They need payment instruments after selling. It's because they have predictable liquidity needs. They need to store the funds that they receive when they sell, and then they pay wages and rents later. Banks are the providers of these payments instruments. Uh, they, need, uh, they also need payment instruments to meet customer outflows. So that's the model I'm gonna use to derive uh, our conclusions. There are... Uh, banks that are competitive. So we're looking at competitive banks and they offer two types of payment instruments, deposits that you can hold before the trade and you can spend these deposits and otherwise you keep the rest. Or you can use a credit line uh, that you can draw down to receive a loan if you need it, uh, but you don't use it otherwise. And then banks charge prices per unit of liquidity that they provide. There are two key financial frictions in banks and farms. Uh, first, there are collateral constraints. Uh, so debt has to be smaller or equal than a fraction phi of the value of assets. And the second financial friction is an asset management service fee, uh, kappa, per unit of assets uh, at price P. To produce these asset management services, uh, that requires capital and labor. Uh, and so the goal of society is to keep balance sheets short. Uh, and so the idea, the motivation for these asset management services is that whenever you have delegated asset management, uh, there are costs involved of doing that. And this is what these asset management ca services capture. Uh, in terms of capital market, uh, banks and firms can costlessly adjust equity uh, and the model is gonna endogenously determine the size of banking uh, as a function of preferences in technology. And we're gonna put these, assume that these uh, preferences and technologies are such that the uh, capital stock is small in banking. So, sorry, banking is small to the overall capital stock in the economy. 
We could also introduce uh, debt for firms and banks, uh, more additional forms of debt, uh, but uh, because households, banks, and central banks can in, uh, invest directly in capital in all these uh, assets, there's a, a version of Ricardian equivalence in Modigliani Miller that is going to hold here, uh, except for trading in liquid instruments. Uh, so it doesn't actually matter to the effects that we highlight will go through, even if we add additional forms of debt. Monica, I'm sorry. Can I, I guess my role is to ask a few questions. Is this a result that you get that the equilibrium size of banking is small? Is that just so that you can match say the US, which has large capital markets, or is, you know, or is that necessary? And then how would you think about say Europe or Japan, which has much more bank dependent finance? Um, so the, the reason we put this in is to have a, an, a model in which the economy doesn't really need to save capital in order to sustain uh, the provision of liquidity. So that, that, that was the, the main modeling goal. But it's also true that in the data, banking is a small share of the overall economy. And so therefore, the, uh, the cap in terms of thinking of banks relative to the overall capital stock, just in terms of the size, it's smaller. So that's, that was the motivation. Uh, behind this assumption in all in all countries. Um, so then we ca can characterize the, the equilibrium uh, of this model. Um, so we can solve for the equilibrium allocation as the solution of a planner problem with a resource constraint. And so the resource constraint here has liquidity costs. These are the omegas that are associated with consumption, investment, and output. And the these omegas, they're going to depend on the details of the payment system that we're considering. And so in this model, the payment system is going to have real effects because uh, if the payment system is more costly, that means that we're operating a production technology which is less efficient. Uh, and otherwise, the allocation res responds as it would in a neoclassical growth model. Uh, so, for example, uh, it can differ by sector. If you have higher liquidity costs in investment than in consumption, let's say, then the payment system actively discourages investment. And you can think of a banking crisis in our model as just a shift in these liquidity costs. So this acts like a technology shock and then the allocation responds as it would in a neoclassical growth model to this technology shocks. And so what I'm now going to do is show you uh, these liquidity costs and welfare for different payment systems. And so then I'm going to first start with uh, a payment system where the only thing that banks offer are deposits. So no credit lines or and no CBDC yet. Uh, so how many deposits are needed to support trade in this model? Uh, so there are buyers of goods. These are households and the capital producers. They need to buy stuff uh, and only a share V of them actually gets to spend deposits to buy. Uh, and so that means that buying consumption plus investment requires a, an amount of deposit that is a multiple of consumption plus investment. And the multiple is one over B. And that has to happen before trade. So, so households and capital producers need this aggregate amount of deposits before they trade. That is because their liquidity needs are unpredictable. That leads to precautionary deposit holdings. So the share one over V is larger than one. Those are the precautionary deposit holdings. The sellers, they're producers of goods. They sell consumption plus investment goods. And that requires deposits V times D, which is the total amount of consumption plus investment after trade. And so who, who trades with whom here and how do banks uh, manage their liquidity needs. So here there are many identical banks, household and firms. Uh, all interbank flows wash out uh, that what's happened here. So the assumption is that bank liquidity constraints don't bind. Um, so if you really wanted to add interbank liquidity flows, we would need to introduce explicitly liquidity shocks of individual banks and then uh, model their reserve holdings and then interbank markets for trading reserves, uh, for lending and borrowing reserves. We did that in earlier work, uh, but it's not really important for what I'm going to show you today. So let's look at balance sheets uh, once uh, we have purchases by buyers uh, from sellers. So buyers uh, own 
deposits. So assets are in green and liabilities are in red. Uh, so they have deposits before the trade. After the trade, uh, they spend their share V of these deposits. Uh, that becomes an asset of the seller. Uh, and bank deposits stay unchanged because they just migrate from the asset side of the buyer to the uh, asset side of sellers. Uh, to think about uh, the liquidity costs associated with this trade, let's think about uh, the liquidity costs associated with that. Uh, so we have uh, two times two minus V uh, time divided by V many deposits. Uh, they require assets one over phi uh, to back these deposits. Uh, these asset holdings come with an asset uh, management fee kappa, which costs P. So these are the liquidity costs of consumption. Uh, if you look at uh, if, if who's buying is uh, a, a capital producer, um, you have to add asset management fees kappa I because they have to hold deposits before they purchase uh, and that creates liquidity costs. And then uh, there is a liquidity cost also associated with selling output uh, that it just is an asset management fee associated with these deposit holdings. Um, and so here, uh, the resource constraint for the equivalent planner problem uh, when banks only offer deposits look like, looks like this. Uh, and you can see that the property of banking uh, with deposits is that liquidity costs are high if liquidity costs needs are unpredictable. So if V is small, if uh, liquidity needs are unpredictable, that generates a lot of precautionary deposit holdings. And that generates a lot, a lot of asset management fees uh, that, are, that represent liquidity costs. And the investment is extra costly because firms are not natural savers. Uh, they have themselves balance sheet costs, kappa I, uh, that generate liquidity costs. So this is the, for the case just with deposits. Let me add credit lines uh, to the model. So how does how do uh, how many deposits and credit lines are needed to support trade in this model? So here the buyers of the goods. They uh, we, we're going to solve for an equilibrium in which they only use credit lines uh, because they have this unpredictable um, liquidity needs buying. Uh, consumption plus investment is cheaper if they do that by arranging for a credit limit before the trade. Uh, the credit limit is just the amount of, before they, they were using deposits, which was a multiple one over V of consumption plus investment. Now this is a credit limit uh, and actual loans that are drawn down are just V times L. That's just consumption plus investment. So in this world, their buyers of the goods don't have precautionary deposit holdings anymore. They just arrange for credit limits and then draw down these credit lines. The sellers uh, sell consumption plus investments, but still they need to uh, hold deposits uh, after trade. And that's a fraction B uh, of, uh, of D that it's consumption plus investment. So how does this look like? Uh, so in, in a world with credit lines, buyers find it cheaper to just draw down a credit, uh, their credit line, V times L. Uh, that becomes an asset of the seller. Uh, and also therefore um, the drawn credit line becomes an asset of the bank. While at the same time, uh, the deposit of the seller becomes a liability of the bank. So now the bank has uh, VL on both sides, but VL uh, is not the, the drawn down loans are not sufficient to back deposits because they have to be backed by more, more assets, uh, a fraction one over phi, phi is smaller than one. So, so banks need to hold additional assets and that's capital. So they add capital holdings, which they back with equity. What are the liquidity costs in this uh, model? Uh, there is no liquidity costs associated with consumption and investments, um, but there's now liquidity costs for associated with selling. Uh, and that's because the sellers, uh, firms that sell uh, consumption goods have asset management uh, fees associated with the deposits that they receive. Uh, and, the, uh, and so this is the size of their liquidity costs. Let's compare uh, the world with and without credit lines. Uh, 
So the first line is uh, are the omegas that are associated uh, with credit lines. And the second line is just deposits. And so now you see that credit lines come with welfare gains. That's because they avoid precautionary holdings of deposits. And that looks like higher G TFP. Also, they avoid firms balance sheet costs uh, because firms are not natural savers. Uh, these invest the capital good producers get away with just using uh, credit lines and that is investment specific technological progress, uh, which increases investment in this model. Uh, the, the two products uh, deposits and credit lines they're complementary because uh, the drawn credit line is an asset that backs deposits, and that looks like higher TFP in this model. Uh, and so the importance here is that this complementarity uh, is due to collateral savings uh, by, farm, by banks. Uh, it's not because uh, this complementarity somehow helps a liquidity constraint of banks. It's just uh, savings in terms of overall collateral asset that banks have to hold. So what happens if a central bank comes into this world with uh, deposits and credit lines and offers central bank digital currency? We're going to assume that the central bank is just like another firm. Uh, it has a maximal leverage parameter phi star and asset management cost kappa star itself. Uh, and then it will um, offer CBDC at marginal cost. Uh, so that's what we're going to assume. The central bank comes in and offers uh, these deposits. And uh, there are two simple results that we can see right away. Uh, CBDC will be good only if the technology that the central bank uh, has is really better. So the welfare gains require that the ratio of kappa star to phi star that the central bank has is strictly smaller than the kappa and the phi that banks have. Uh, that commercial banks have. So either the central for CBDC to be good and preferable uh, in welfare sense, it either has to uh, come with cheaper asset management that the central bank has, and that, that seems plausible, or there's a better ability to commit um, that the central bank has. So either one is needed for CBDC to be desirable. Another result is that CBDC is good if the technology is better and bank, banks only offer deposits. So in a world with only deposits, it's clear that, the, uh, that it's great to have CBDC if the technology is better because then all depositors just migrate to the central bank. Um, commercial banks will disappear in our world because they have no value beyond uh, liquidity provision. They're not important for making loans in our world. We'd have a liability-centric view of banks that views them as important as liquidity provider. And that means investment actually in our model increases uh, once deposits migrate to the central bank uh, because liquidity has become cheaper. And so these results are, are easy to derive. The question is what happens if banks also offer credit lines? Uh, so what if CBDC is added to a world where, uh, sent, where banks also offer credit lines? So now buyers and sellers uh, face a choice of payment instruments if uh, the world has deposits and credit lines uh, and CBDC. And so suppose deposits and CBDC are priced the same so that bank customers are indifferent between these two products. But buyers will still use credit lines. Uh, so that's we're in a world in which uh, their liquidity needs are unpredictable and the technology of the central bank is not too great so that uh, CBDC is not that cheap that even buyers switch to CBDC. Uh, in the paper, we also analyzed the case when uh, households stop using credit lines altogether. Uh, but let's assume that they still, the buyers uh, still use credit lines. Then the response by commercial banks uh, to this entry uh, by the central bank in the, in the, with CBDC is to still issue deposits. Uh, they match the higher interest rate uh, that CBDC earns. They increase the price of credit lines to break even. And that is associated with high funding costs for banks. Uh, so it's no longer profitable for them to invest in other capital. 
Uh, so bank assets will be just the loans from the John credit lines. That's, that will be their only assets. Uh, and there will be a deposit outflow to, to CBDC. Uh, and there's gonna be liquidity costs for banks because they face now their own liquidity constraint because of these deposit outflows to the central bank. Uh, banks themselves have to hold CBDC before the trade. And so let's look at the um, balance sheets, how this looks like. Uh, so here are buyers still pay sellers with drawn credit lines that become assets on the back of banks. Uh, and it will also generate deposits, but banks will only keep uh, a, fr a fraction phi of these assets as deposits. The rest will migrate to the central bank and to uh, prepare for these outflows of deposits, banks will uh, start holding central bank digital currency before the trade happens so that they can accommodate these outflows. And now we can uh, sum up together. So the, the resource constraint now looks much messier. I will spare you the equation and just tell you the main result is that CBDC in a world with bank deposits and credit lines uh, improves welfare, even only if uh, the central bank technology, uh, so Kappa star over Phi star is smaller, is much smaller than the technology or is much more efficient than the technology that banks use. Uh, and the expression here tells you how much more efficient uh, the, the central bank uh, di digital currency has to be. So it has to be sufficiently cheap to offset the cost of the credit line, which is basically higher TFB. Uh, if the uh, central bank is only marginally uh, more efficient than central bank, CBDC reduces welfare in this world. And so the, one of the questions uh, is, can central banks actually help uh, the asset side, keep the asset side of the banks unchanged if they offer a credit line to banks uh, and so bridge this uh, out deposit outflow? And the answer is that no, actually, uh, by offering a credit line, that's, that generates also higher liquidity costs. So let me skip this. Let me repeat the overall message is that CBDC uh, here was interest uh, bearing reserve accounts for everyone, uh, when they enter into a market for liquidity that has not only deposits, but also credit lines, then uh, it's not clear that CBDC is uh, beneficial. It's beneficial only if it's much cheaper to produce than deposits. Thank you. Can I ask you a quick question before I go to discussion? I presume that these kind of qualitative lessons would continue if you thought about the fact that you know, intermediate transactions, not just final transactions require liquidity and that we have a gross volume of transactions in asset markets that also require liquidity to settle. I mean, your model is focused on final transactions, but I assume these types of considerations would go through. Yes, I, I think so too, yes. Okay. Well, then, thank you. That was very clear. I'll go to <laughs> my discussion, if that's all right. Um, all right. So uh, hopefully everyone sees this. Is that a thumbs up? Excellent. So thank you for asking me to discuss this paper. I enjoyed it. It brought back issues that um, uh, I encountered in when I first arrived as an assistant professor at Chicago with Bob Lucas, when we taught a course on the transactions demand for money. Uh, so it was very enjoyable for me to read. Uh, one of the first points I wanna make just right off the bat, I wasn't as aware of this as perhaps as I should be, uh, bank customers really do like to use credit lines. This is from an FDIC survey <clears throat> they do annually and it, how, you know, how households use banking and financial services uh, and we see here that for households with over $75,000 in annual income, you know, 80 plus percent of them, 90%, uh, depending on race, are using um, credit lines uh, as well as being a bank customer. So I do think uh, Monica and Martin are pointing to something important that banks are offering sort of a bundled package of financial services. But in terms of my discussion, uh, I'd like to provoke a conversation uh, 
first of, you know, can this model be used to assess what happened with money market mutual funds? You don't need a central bank digital currency to come into competition with banks. We already had in the US starting in the 1970s, money market mutual funds coming in. And of course they do not offer credit lines. So I'll say a few words about that. Maybe we can take that up in the general discussion. And then I'm gonna reveal myself to be a dinosaur. I feel like perhaps I'm a shareholder in Barnes and Noble in the mid 1990s when Amazon comes on and I say, is it really plausible that they'll wipe out bookstores? And I'm gonna say no. <laughs> and then I, I'll say there's something else I think that is very important that hasn't been discussed. The, the act of settling payments attracts a lot of revenue and a lot of profits. And that has not been discussed in this model. That is a bundled financial service that is in competition. You know, banks are now in competition with non-bank providers. And so there's questions of like, one role of a CBDC would be to improve settlement. And just, we can talk in the Q of A of how would you put that in the model. Uh, so just first, money market mutual funds came in in the 1970s, probably a product of regulation. I'm showing here the assets in money market mutual funds, both retail and institutional relative to M2. So, you know, they've taken a, a substantial share of the market, uh, different from what Monica and Martin discussed. Uh, you know, money market mutual funds are probably at least got their entree into this business because of regulation rather than some inherent cost advantage. Um, and Monica and Martin mentioned in the paper that if the central bank digital currency did attract a lot of deposits, it would in some sense uh, then become an important source of funding for banks. And we actually have seen that with money market mutual funds. Um, so then we have kind of, we're, we're, amp, we're, we're scaling up the asset management costs by running it through the money market mutual funds. And because money market mutual funds don't directly offer uh, this bundled package with credit lines through the mechanisms they've discussed in their model, we should have seen then a growth of excess liquidity in the system. So as a historical exercise, rather than as a, projection about central bank digital currencies, it seems that one could use a model along these lines, perhaps, you know, with other features added to make it kind of more quantitative, to ask a question retrospectively, you know, socially, what did we lose by <laughs> having money market mutual funds introduced? Um, but let me go to this issue about uh, central bank digital currencies. And is it plausible that they're going to compete directly with, sent, with uh, banks for deposits. Ricardo already mentioned in his introductory remarks that we have a central bank digital currency, it's called reserves and our access to it is intermediated through banks. And if you actually think about physical currency, if you wanna take your torn dollar bill or you wanna your, your supermarket and you wanna get rid of your cash, our access to physical currency is also intermediated through banks. And I think that, you know, here I'm being the dinosaur in favor of brick and mortar. It takes labor and physical capital to market and provide financial services to consumers and firms. And I just don't see central banks as being in a position to do that. So let me be a little bit more explicit about that. This is a table that shows you the number of branches that major banks have we have, you know, for the top banks here, we have four or 5,000 branches. Uh, and then we do have a couple of exceptions. You know, Charles Schwab and Morgan Stanley don't have branches, but, you know, I'm somebody who has used a brokerage account uh, for 30 years as my primary financial instrument. And Charles Schwab does have a lot of offices. They're just not bank branches that you can go into. You know, Fidelity has them too. Goldman Sachs is trying to market an online only bank, but you see that so far their total deposits are pretty small relative to what we see up here. And Goldman Sachs, of course, is bundling other financial services to high net worth individuals, you know, through this Marcus bank that they have. Another feature is that, 
you know, banks employ hundreds of thousands of people. And, you know, the Federal Reserve System, their total employment, I think, is 23,000. So unless we're going to see some substantial increase in employment in the central bank, or unless the central bank has some magic wand that they can say, oh, you guys were wasting your time hiring all these people and building all these branches, I'm a little skeptical that they'll be able to uh, attract directly substantial deposits. Uh, it's also true that you know, we talk about uh, there's a lot of literature on the deposit channel of monetary policy and the rest and imperfect competition in banking. In the data, banks do obtain substantial what I'll call quasi rents from their deposit base. So what is in this graph is, a, is an attempt to measure those quasi rents. Mercer Capital reports regularly on what they call core deposit intangible values. So what's going on here is when one bank buys another, when it buys the branches of another bank, they usually pay over book value. And so in the accounting of that merger transaction, they have to attribute some of the goodwill, you know, the excess of purchase price over book value to various, you know, categories. And one of the categories is what they call the deposit intangible value is just the fact that the cost of deposits is less than the cost of market funding for a bank. And so we see um, that these things are about between one and 2% of the total stock of deposits. So these are rather substantial. So the model of banking I have in my mind or the, the model of the provision of financial services, it's not unique to banking is that you have to invest like any business in a marketing effort and a physical presence and a service effort to attract then a, you know, what is to you as a bank, a profitable financial you know, line of business. And, and unless the central bank is gonna be like Amazon and really kind of try to be a business, I don't see it as being able to enter into this market. Um, the other issue I mentioned is this thing about payments versus liquidity services. I mean, one of the things you get when you bank is an ability to settle transactions. And it is true with money market mutual funds that if you want to actually you know, write a check or pay a bill, your, you know, your account is, is or Fidelity is providing those services through a bank. Uh, I think State Street is a particular bank that does a lot of this and earns a lot of revenue. And one thing about payment services, the central bank does have what I'll call a, a, an unfair advantage, but a true advantage in providing credit to support payment settlements. If you think, for instance, about Fedwire, where they guarantee all intraday credit between banks. There's quite a lot of credit being provided. You know, at the retail level, Visa and MasterCard are providing this credit when a, a merchant gets a, a, an authorization, the merchant knows he or she is gonna be paid even though the bank that issued the credit card doesn't know yet that the consumer is gonna pay the bill. Uh, so Visa steps in there and has arrangement with, with banks to do that. I guess conceptually, the central bank could provide this type of intraday or you know, settlement credit associated with settlements. Uh, at the retail level, this would seem to be a pretty risky business for the <laughs> central bank to get into. But I do think you know, it's worth thinking more carefully about what payment settlement innovations a central bank could bring about relative to what we already have. I mean, not only do we have Fedwire, but the, you know, the Fed introduced some time ago the ACH payment system, uh, trying to get into the, you know, simplify the check clearing business, and uh, perhaps that they can do more. But, you know, I'll get to this question of why are Square and PayPal so valuable? Because I think that this, I don't understand, and I think that this is really the key issue to think about what a central bank 
digital currency might do in the payments arena. So this is just data I wanted to use to provoke thought about where do banks get their revenues connected to the provision of payments and liquidity services. So this is a chart from uh, McKinsey Global Payments Report, an annual report on the kind of payments business. And we have columns, Asia Pacific, North America, Europe, and Latin America. And we have these bars are divided. The gray bars refer to what's going on with uh, consumer accounts and the blue stuff at the top is, is, is referring to what's going on with commercial accounts. These numbers across the top give you total revenue in billions. And let's just take North America. So on the consumer side, the provision of credit through credit cards is a very large portion of the revenue. Domestic transactions, these are basically settlement fees or another large portion of revenue. And then what they call account related liquidity, which would be the gap between say a market interest rate and a deposit rate is relatively small. And then of course you have cross border transactions which are super expensive and you have the corresponding items for uh, uh, for commercial accounts. So kind of the key lesson I wanna take from this graph is, you know, around the globe transactions processing you know, there is true that the interest rate you earn on liquidity services can be important here we have in Asia, but transactions processing is a very big part of bank revenue. And this is something that's kind of not discussed in the paper. Another fact that I find very striking is this comparison of the market capitalization of banks versus payments providers. Uh, so this is uh, an estimate of the total market cap of four large payment companies, Visa, MasterCard, Square, and PayPal, so a little over a trillion dollars. And this is the total market cap of the six big banks being JP Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, and Goldman Sachs. And even more remarkable, you know, these payments companies basically don't have balance sheets. So they're trading at market to book like about 30. And the banks are trading at market to book well under one. So, you know, there is this question, and I think an important area to understand, there's something really profitable, high revenue and high profits in processing payments. Are these things rents? Are they quasi rents? Could a central bank digital currency do something about this market if these things are rents? I think that these are kind of central questions to push this discussion uh, further. So I just might summarize and open it up to Q&A. I think it's a huge contribution to this paper to focus on banking as a business. I just wanna stress, banks hire hundreds of thousands of people and have thousands and thousands of branches. You know, they're kind of like the pizza business. <laughs> so I ask myself, like, would the central bank wanna get into that business? I, I do think though, and this model can also have a big contribution both for historical work relative to money market mutual funds, currently on the development of FinTech non-bank payments providers and going forward, you know, as technology develops, what do we want to do? But I want to stress that kind of the central contribution, people have to start thinking about this as a business. It's kind of like making steel or cars and we have to think about the IO of it that way. All right, so thank you. Um, thanks a lot, Andy and Monica. Um, so uh, before I uh, ask Monica to like have any, to answer any comments or responses to Andy. So to the audience, please raise your hands uh, if you have any questions and, or if you would like to uh, participate, we would love you to participate in the general Q and A. So Monica, uh, please, if you have anything to discuss with Andy. First, I wanted to thank uh, Andy for an awesome discussion. Uh, these are really great comments. Uh, I agree with Andy that I think the, the model is useful to think about the introduction of money market mutual funds. Um, the way I think about that is that there, there was sort of, when, when they arrived in the 1970s, uh, regulation Q was in place. Uh, and so there basically, we would have to apply the model in a situation where banks were not allowed to match the interest rate that 
money market mutual funds were paying. Uh, so we would need to introduce an interest rate cap on deposits uh, by banks into the model. And then what we would see in equilibrium is that the deposits would outflow to the money market mutual funds and uh, banks' credit lines would get more expensive because funding costs for banks would go up. Uh, and that's, I, I, when I look at the data, I feel like we saw that. We saw in this intermediation uh, of the banking system, we saw a shrinkage of the banking sector in the 1970s when money market mutual funds grew. Uh, and so then the, the welfare effects of the introduction of these money market mutual funds depends on how many people prefer to use credit lines as opposed to deposits because credit lines became more expensive. Uh, and then today, the situation without regulation, we have basically this, I compare this uh, with the entrance uh, of an institution that doesn't have a technological advantage. Uh, and then this is this situation today. It's also interesting to think about stable coins like Libra, which I think of as glorified uh, money market funds. Um, in, this, in this situation today where uh, banks are able to match interest rates, uh, and the, the entrance doesn't have a technological advantage. In our model, there would be multiple equilibria. Uh, customers would be indifferent between all these deposits uh, and the model is perfectly fine with the current existence uh, of these different instruments. There would be inefficiencies if credit line providers were required to hold more liquid funds to uh, make sure that when customers of these different uh, devices pay each other, uh, if, if banks have to hold liquidity to uh, make sure that they can accommodate all these liquidity movements, uh, that is inefficient in our setup. The, the other very interesting thing that Andy uh, raised is this um, custodian relationship between money market funds and banks uh, in the US. Uh, money market funds don't have access to Fed wire, only their custodian banks do. Uh, and that's a high fee business um, for banks to provide these custodian accounts. And so then the, the question is, would it be better to think of money market mutual funds as one combined entity with commercial banks? Uh, because basically they combine, we think of them as basically circumventing uh, regulation. Uh, is, is that how we should have them in the model? The, uh, Andy raised this issue of Visa and MasterCard and uh, their mar market cap and also them as, as uh, um, financial intermediaries. The, the way I think about them in our model is that they provide an intermediate input uh, for banks. They provide basically the Visa payment network that banks have to buy in order to provide credit cards. Uh, and so the credit, the drawn credit lines are on the balance sheets of the banks, uh, while the bank is only provide, is buying these, uh, the network, the paying network from Visa and MasterCard. Uh, to the extent, as Andy was right, to the extent that there is uh, limited competition uh, in the provision of, this, uh, of, of these networks to banks, um, then it's interesting to think about uh, rents in that sector and how that would interact with uh, a CBDC and more generally monopoly power. So monopoly power of banks in the deposit markets is going to um, uh, favor the introduction of CBDC. So this is gonna be an argument in favor of CBDC. In fact, there's a paper by David Anwald Fato that uh, analyzes that uh, what happens when CBDC uh, competes with banks and banks have a deposit uh, market power and deposits. But the number of branches, I'm not as worried about uh, those as Andy is, uh, because the number of branches of banks have been coming down. Uh, customers go to the branch when they open an account. So that's what they used to do in the past. Now they open their accounts on the internet. Uh, people go to branches when they get, they want advice about asset management. Um, and so it's not really associated with the, I, I don't view the, the presence of branches as they are uh, to support the deposit business, but they are to support other functions that banks have, like asset management. Um, I, I, agree with, you. I, think it's I agree with almost everything that you say, except for the last point. I recently <laughs> had an experience where Fidelity debited the same check from my account twice. And it took me two days on the phone, including with the person to whom the check was addressed, to get one of those transactions reversed. I picture myself talking to a bureaucrat in a central bank 
trying to understand if they'd made an error in debiting my account, how I would ever fix it. So I'll just say that I, even if you don't need a branch, you still need service personnel uh, when stuff goes wrong. I mean, I would add also, by the way, Andy, I mean, there's another element to that, which is, you know, money laundering legislation requires you that when you take a deposit also to check the customer and so on. So there are costs that will take. So, but I don't think CBDC, and this is the point that Monica and Martin are making is CBDC is not about the commercial side of I can go and open an account. Like I said, I mean, I can see an enormous margin of intermediaries that will offer that service for me. They have the branches. The key is they can deposit central bank, set, settle the central bank, and then can they or not offer the credit lines that Monica said. So I thought your money market funds is kind of the right analogy, but the, the using of the branches, I don't think any central bank thinks that they're going to have, do, do the simple document verification for your customer and money laundering. No central bank has the ability to do that, I think. No, but so then Ricardo, I think that, so Square is a good example. Square wants to get into the provision of credit lines to businesses because they feel that once they have the sales data, so I could see FinTech firms, in other words, if you're telling me that a central bank digital currency is about enabling non-bank intermediaries to provide the same bundle of services that Monica and Martin are discussing, which is, you know, credit lines and payment services and liquidity, well, Square is not offering deposits, but they, you know, then I'm like, sure, it, you're just basically handing out more bank charters. You know, it's not, it's not really about a central bank digital currency, it's about who can get a bank charter. And, and I think that uh, uh, it's the, uh, it, it's, I interpreted Monica Martin as discussing and others as discussing you would go direct to the customer uh, as a central bank. Okay, guys, I'm gonna, this is a really cool discussion. We are all like absorbed, but I wanna ask some questions from the audience. So oh, let me go there. So the first question is from uh, Juan Carlos Zambrano uh, uh, from uh, my own university, Ireland. Juan Carlos, please. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, oh, perfect. Uh, no, you, I just wrote a question regarding the technology factor because, uh, I mean, it seems it's in, in, in the Monica's model, it seems that, I mean, this is something that, that uh, plays a role in, 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 in if, 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 the, if the central banks should uh, do um, the payment system to see uh, if, if it should do the CBDC. Uh, but my question is, is how, how, I mean, in the model, how, how do you consider, I mean, uh, the competition in terms of technology with, you know, the, the, um, uh, the providers of the technology that are basically trying to make a more distributed market rather than a centralized model? Do you want Monica? one question at a time or do you want to accumulate questions, Mary? Um, no, I would say, um, um, uh, so let me ask, well, let me, I mean, we're kind of running out of time. So let me ask one more question. Pierre Olivier had a question from uh, UCLA. So Pierre Olivier, do you want to ask? And then Monica, you should answer. We have more questions, but you won't have time for them. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Monica. I just wanted to ask a clarification about uh, the precise mechanism, mechanism that makes deposits and credit lines complements, and what's the empirical or theoretical support for, uh, for that? So, so the, the, the way it works in the model is that the, mm -hmm. um, whenever, so banks have to back deposits with assets. Uh, that's the mm -hmm. key assumption. And the, the, if uh, they also offer credit lines, the drawn credit lines uh, become an asset that backs deposits. And so in terms of thinking about liquidity provision, the cheapest way to provide uh, the most liquidity is to uh, offer deposits um, and then back them with drawn credit lines. That's the, that saves on balance sheet costs uh, and still respects the collateral constraint. And so the way I think about collateral constraints is that the, um, 
any firm that has that wants to issue debt and wants to convince its investors that they're going to repay the debt, it will have to um, put down some collateral. Uh, and the the asset might be the desire to keep the the balance sheet short is that there's some costs of associated with. Uh, managing being uh, having delegated ma uh, asset management either some moral hazard or some other costs that are uh, associated with having somebody else manage your assets um, right you want to 